share uh, from here. Okay. And and let you kick things off, and I'm going to get it full screen. Perfect. All right. Well, uh, Joe, thank you for uh, the kind kind words introduction, and uh, it's always fun to to tag team with a, a good friend and colleague of mine that I respect a lot, uh, Arshim Shabani, on uh, kind of some just deep thoughts on on the Maltino implant. Um, is, do you have the, I guess I'm gonna have to cue you for the slides. So these are my consults, my, my disclosures. Um, we, this is a, uh, you know, we are uh, paid con speakers for uh, for Nova Eye, uh, but these are our own thoughts, our own slides and our own opinions. Uh, and those are Arshram's disclosures. Um, so we're gonna start off just about talking about, you know, the non-valved implants, discuss more specifically the Maltino. Uh, then Arshram is gonna go on to some, uh, some of the data on Maltino, which he's helped create. Uh, we'll talk about different scenarios and then um, go on to tying off the tube in different ways and we'll have an exchange on that based on the different styles and then the answer to the question everybody already knows is whether a size matters so um, and then we'll wrap it up it seems like we really emphasize this point too there's there's, <laughs> there, there's two two different bullet points just for that <laughs> exactly so you know when i uh you know this is just a, a surgical algorithm what i think about is you know i tell my patients Patients were basically fancy plumbers, and um, and this is the scenario in which we are creating a new drain uh, drainage system, specifically a tube shunt. And uh, so, can you can you kind of go over maybe um, how you might select going to like a tube shunt instead of something else? Is there like a certain patient profile you'll say, "Hey, look, I think I'm going to go directly tube." Yeah, you know, I think a lot of that our decision making process has been informed by uh, you know TTV, uh, PTVT, TVT. Uh, you know, I think our, our first goal is to uh, open up the patient's own outflow system, you know, make this as physiologic as possible through different types of angle procedures. Um, and then if, if that doesn't work, or um, if, if we don't think it would tend to work based on uh, features of their eyes, multiple prior surgeries, conjunctival scarring, all that stuff, then uh, then we go into the uh, the option of creating a new drain. And, and there are less invasive ways for uh, for subconch filtration. But, you know, when you really need a kind of when I think of a tube, I'm, I think of just, look, I want to create an outflow system that's not going to scar down, that's going to be a true exit site for aqueous that's less uh, dependent on a patient's ability to form scar tissue. And, um, and, and really, I know it's going to work and not clogged up. So, so I kind of go in that paradigm. I mean, it's what I like to do. I like to, I like to avoid doing any traps or tubes when I can. Um, but, uh, but we obviously need them. Uh, what about you, Arshan? What what's your, what's your thought process? Yeah, I'm very similar. I mean, especially like mild to moderate, generally, we're trying to open up the natural physiologic outflow pathway. Um, but you know, for primary tube shunts, uh, many times it's patients coming in from a distance, especially when you have a tube shunt where you really can kind of understand like how it's going to go and how it'll open, when it'll open and what you'll get. And, and I think for any of you doing glaucoma surgery, just once you start getting facile with a couple of tubes, you might end up just picking one that just works, works for you. And then, like you said, um, there is a lot of data now with like TVT and PTVT and if you're thinking about going in the subconj route for whatever reason, maybe the angles failed or um, maybe they've already had cataract surgery and we kind of know based on some of that data, those patients with a tube after FACO or if their pressures are kind of 21, 22 and above, um, patients with a tube shunt generally seem to do better than, than trap patients, uh, especially if they've had surgery before. Yeah. And you're right. I mean, back in the day, you know, when tubes first came out in the in the 80s, uh, they were really for extremely refractory eyes, right? That had failed TRAB 1, TRAB 2, and TRAB 3. And um, and then what, uh, you know, Steve Getty and his colleagues have done with uh, what first TBT, now PTVT is showing us exactly what you said, is that we can use it earlier in the disease spectrum if it is uh, if it's best for the patient and their mm -hmm. eyes. So I think commute and post-operative ability to manipulate things are, uh, is, a, is a key thing. Um, I really like tubes in my monocular patients. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it gives me absolute control. Um, and, um, and, and there are a lot of, we'll talk about different other scenarios in which uh, I think we think tubes are, are, are great. And so, you know, these are the available non-valved tubes right now. There's also a tube called the Audi implant um, out of India uh, that does not have FDA approval, uh, but these are the currently available um, 
non-valve tubes in, in alphabetical order. Uh, roughly, you know, usually we'll typically have two, two different sizes and, and we'll get to that discussion. Uh, uh, but specifically, uh, we're gonna focus on the Maltino, which is what is um, um, Nova I is, is promoting. Uh, there, are, there are two sizes, you know, it's been an evolution. It's one of the oldest plates that has been around. So I, I can say with confidence that it's, the, it's one of the tube shunts that we have the most experience with. Uh, back to this in single plates, I'm not sure if some of you have um, patients that, um, that have the double plate back in the 80s. You can see at the bottom, there's two dog bowls. Uh, they used to tuck it underneath the superior rectus. Mm -hmm. um, and then there was an evolution in the design um, down at that middle one just to the left. That's, that's Tony Maltino, a picture of him who, who developed this and one of the pioneers of tube shunts. And then to the left of this picture is uh, one of the old school Maltinos. And then they, they changed the style even further to move the, uh, those little eyelets more anterior. That's gonna, it helps with suturing. Uh, yeah, and, and I, I love the fact that there is um, some rigidity to it because, you know, many times like you'll do a dissection, you're in the subconscious space, and if it's something that's a little bit flimsier and you're trying to push it back, you might have to take your tube out and, and redissect again. We do a lot of teaching with residents and fellows, and so um, it's not going to be sometimes as smooth. And I think that that applies to people that are starting out doing tube shunts. Um, when they're a little bit more rigid, if you haven't gotten a great dissection, is you start to place the tube um, down into the quadrant where you've dissected, it almost blunt dissects things away from you without causing like a big hemorrhage. And, and again, that's been another kind of advantage for me when, when I switched doing these years ago. Yeah, I think that's oh. a huge point. The, um, the other thing that, you know, it's funny, I used to, um, whenever I was doing kids, I still do kids, but um, whenever I do kids, I always look in their history, even adults, and, and think about whether they've had muscle surgery. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, you know, one key component, uh, is if they've already had prior strabismus surgery and I can't get the records and I'm worried that it was either the superior lateral rectus, I don't want to be tugging on that muscle. And it is nice to, to, to be able to not isolate the muscles or touch the muscles. Yeah. I think that that's a great point. Um, and we're already getting some questions in here, so we'll answer them as we go. Let me uh, just briefly talk about the Maltino three is newer series. You know, it, it is interesting with that that smaller drainage area, that primary drainage area, and with the design of the tube, potentially you could use this for immediate drainage. Um, I don't personally, I still take a look in any of these devices that don't have like a pressure resistor built in, like the Ahmed, um, I will tie off. And there are some advantages there potentially to maybe avoiding early uh, hypertensive phases. But if you compare these in general, non-valve tubes to valve tubes, we expect to find a better success rate regarding pressure and medications. And safety profiles might vary, but I think this has kind of been borne out time and time again. Certainly, if you start thinking about using AMEDs with different techniques and aqueous suppressions and maybe anti-metabolites, that could change things. But there's nothing truly randomized head to head. And, um, and a lot of data will take off the Bearvelt and Ahmed comparison studies. And, and we do maybe wrongly sometimes apply them to other non-valve tubes. But even anecdotally, I think we see this. Now, this kind of uh, dog bowl area, the, the primary drainage area, there is some theory behind why this is there. And, and a lot of what we do is we're trying to maximize our bleb porosity or how much fluid leaves the bleb or the capsule that's formed around the plate. And I think anytime you have any work in trying to improve bleb porosity, maybe promote early apoptosis to where we're getting less thick capsule deposition around plates, I think it's worthwhile. The question becomes, you know, does it apply and do we get like a big clinical result? And I don't know that yet, but I think it's important to, to kind of think about that when we're picking drainage implants. Does our tube shunt promote better bleb formation just by design? And and I think there is one, one advantage here because at least that thought has been put into it. Um, you know, let me, uh, let me answer, ask a question here. George Sanaka talks a lot about super tenons tube placement. Do you have a preference of where you place the tube? And, and here we're really talking about where, where we're placing the plate. Devinder, maybe you start and, and I can kind of hop on after that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I... I put them sub. I put them sub tenons. I, I do a nice dissection. Uh, you know, I uh, I'm not as. And we'll talk a little bit more about this later with how we use uh, low energy diode to supplement our tubes to kind of tweak to make it get them work better. Um, but um, but I, I don't use anything to to around the plate 
to, to minimize scar tissue. I, I, you know, I don't, I know there's some decent data out of uh, UCSF with mitomycin C and Ahmed valves. Um, I, I still don't do that yet. And I don't, uh, I don't put plates over the tenons. I, I really put them, I want them back. I want them covered by conge and tenons. I don't want a plate erosion or uh, exposure. You know, a tube erosion is a different game. It's a little bit easier to fix and you can usually salvage those uh, based on the technique you use. But when you get a plate exposure or erosion, you're pretty much done. You've got to take that thing out um, and go to a different quadrant. So I, I really don't like, um, I don't like that. And I, I can, I, the only caveat is I'd, I've never done a super tenons uh, placement. Uh, it's just how I was trained. And uh, it's one of the few things I still do the same from fellowship to now. Uh, so I still like to put them underneath the tenons. What do you yeah, do? I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I, I go under tenons for a lot of similar reasons. You know, if I had like pretty convincing data that the pressures were going to be better in truly subconscious place, just kind of randomized, I, I might switch. Um, but but you're right, like one small buttonhole over a plate and that that could lead to a totally different ball game. The other thing is this, you know, we'll place them. If you place a device um, over tenons, it kind of depends on where your tenons is. If you're careful not to dissect tenons off the sclera, then I think it's reasonable. But if you get into tenons, you will start to get fibroblasts moving around. They'll form a capsule around a plate. So even if you didn't intend to place it sub tenons, you could still get a pretty thick walled capsule around plates. So a lot of it also depends on the dissection, making sure that you're not penetrating through tenons when, when you place the device. And um, another question, you might get into this later, but how do you compare the Multino 3 to the Clear Path 250? And we can definitely uh, talk about that um, as we go into it. So I'm not gonna click off of that. Let's save it because we definitely have room for discussion. And, and again, a lot of this is going to be some anecdotal stuff as we talk about this because uh, ClearPath's very new um, and we don't have anything randomized or even retrospective comparing the two. So if you look at some of the data and if you look at some of uh, Dr. Maltino's original studies, we'll, we'll get into that. But I'll impress upon you this. You will find, regardless of surgery naive patients, regardless of if we're treating POAG, neovascular, secondary open angle glaucomas, or people with failed surgery, that tube shunts do well. And they can do dramatically well in extremely elevated pressures. In this particular study, it was retrospective, but you're talking about starting pressures that were in the mid 30s with four classes of medications. Those are patients that need surgery. And this is a result that I would expect almost regardless of where we're starting as far as the pressures go. Um, it could be 25, it could be 35. Tubes are gonna get you somewhere in that mid-teen range and your pressures are gonna come down for the vast majority of your patients. The reoperation rates at a year are going to probably be around 10% or less. And then the medications should drop pretty dramatically. And, and this is consistent. I think what we'll get into as we get later into the talk is Devinder and I might talk a little bit about how to optimize those results. Um, but if you look at this study, again, it shows a dramatic reduction. If you look at some of the, the um, earlier studies randomizing Maltino to trabeculectomy, the beauty is you have so much follow-up. I mean, I think some of the original papers came out in 69. It made it to the US a few years after that before people started using them. And like Devinder mentioned, probably wasn't until the 80s until tube shunts really were, were more popularized. And what's interesting to me is things really happen for a reason. It's not random chance. We are seeing, and it's been that way for years now, in Medicare reimbursement data, a decline in trabeculectomy and more tube shunt surgeries. And, and so is that because all our traps have failed and we're going to tube? No, I think people are kind of realizing that it is a good primary option in the right patient, even over trabeculectomy. When we have these, this many patients prospectively at least followed between these two major staples of surgery, it is impressive when you have pressures that most of us see. I think a lot of our patients that are going to surgery are somewhere in the low 20s when they get a tube. And at 20 years, you're still getting dramatic reductions um, in pressures. Now, some of these were with the dual plate. Um, some of them might have had additional surgeries uh, down the line, but it is pretty impressive looking at the, at the longevity here. And if you're looking at this to Bearvel, this is something that we looked at, and I'll give you a little bit of kind of caveats about our patient population. For one, um, we treat uh, quite a high proportion of African-American patients. Most of our surgical series um, are going to have at least 30% that are going to be darkly pigmented, and we know that scar formation can be worse in, in those eyes. And I say that because sometimes I can't recreate the results that are seen 
in other series, especially if you're looking at some European data. Um, here we had pressures that really reduced for both groups, but this was a non-inferiority analysis. What we're looking to see was, you know, I started using Maltino um, for some of the reasons that we talked about before. I liked that it was rigid. I liked that I did not have to hook muscles and place wings beneath them. I can tell you anecdotally, we couldn't do this in a retrospective review, but anecdotally, it is a much less uncomfortable procedure. It's not this painful procedure where sometimes you hook a muscle and you're driving things through. Even if you're using sutures to isolate muscles, patients feel that regardless of, of how good you are with your anesthetic. And, and that's what kind of correlates to more efficiency as far as uh, performing this. Tube shunts in general are um, relatively invasive procedures as far as kind of the conjunctival opening. But it's nice whenever you have something that isn't so terrible for the patient experience and also more efficient because we're not having to, to isolate muscles and place them, place them under there. But if you look, the data is very similar between the two groups. And this is kind of where the size matter. I don't know. I mean, you're talking a 245 plate size versus a 350. And even compared to the 250, um, the IOP reduction was extremely similar between both groups, as were the medications. And then if we talk about the Maltino compared to Bear Velts and even other case series, um, we see similar things. And these are going to be, again, dramatic percentage drops in, in pressure and dramatic reductions in medications. And, and this is very believable to me, where we're starting to get 30 to 40 percent pressure reductions and, and cutting the meds down in half. And Again, we, we talk about these in comparison to other devices, probably to show a little bit of equality in, in the end results. But what you need to start factoring then is what's going to be more efficient in your hands and, and what scenarios would you pick your different, different plates and different devices? And, and I think Devinder has some really interesting kind of pearls on when he likes to do Maltinos over, um, over Bearveld devices. Now, I can tell you, if you look at Maltinos compared to Bearvelds, I feel completely comfortable doing a Maltino in a patient with a really high eye pressure. That's okay to me. Um, I think the adage is, and Devendra, correct me if I'm wrong, most people say, you know, if the pressure is really high, start with an Ahmed, you can get it down immediately. Well, even if you completely occlude the tube with the suture, the fenestrations will get your pressure down. Anytime you're starting with a new tube shunt, I would caution people to maybe use a single fenestration, get a sense of what's doing before you start doing multiple. Um, and But if you're comparing this to the Ahmed, uh, Ahmed can actually have a little bit more early hypotony, even if you leave viscoelastic in there compared to non-valve tube shunts. And you'll get pretty similar results, but as you can see, at least in this study, the Maltino in the long run did have lower pressures. Um, and the mean medications are a little bit more, it's 1.4 to one, um, but the lower pressure at 24 months here is what, what they found in that, that study. So maybe um, Devinder can talk about some specifics and we, I can chime in back and forth as far as when I would say, hey, for sure, this is when I use a Maltino over the other options that we have. Yeah, sure. Uh, that was, a, you know, that was a, a great summary. Uh, the only, um, you know, when you're talking about Ahmed versus a Maltino, I kind of think of those patients as two different yeah. patient populations yeah. I would target. You know, when I think of Ahmed valves, thinking about the hot neovascular eyes, the bad uveitic eyes. Uh, one thing that's interesting I noticed about Maltino, you know, I'm glad you mentioned this, Arsham, which is when you're first starting to get used to a new type of tube, a tube shunt, you know, it's the Maltino, my fenestrations with Maltino work a little bit longer mm -hmm. than uh, fenestrations that I've done with bar belts. Uh, and I think the tube, even though they're same, very, very similar, they're a little bit, um, I think the structure is just a little bit different. Um, and I would say if you do, when you do use uh, fenestrations, uh, the more fenestrations you use, you need to make sure your conge closure, you got to be a stickler about your conge mm -hmm. closure mm -hmm. um, and close it the way you would a trab basically, because you're going to have some subconge flow. Um, we have a question about whether we use a Latina stitch with a Maltino, and we're going to get to that because I'm going to have a whole section on, uh, on, on uh, the varying techniques of, um, uh, of closing off the tube. But, you know, Arsham, we brought it, we, you know, you brought it up early on as far as when we use it. I think it's, it is that without question, I think uh, can be used for all types of surgical glaucoma as primary or secondary interventions. Um, but, you know, I think there are a couple of things that, and I'll show a couple of videos later about this, uh, you know, really with the, the, the smaller Maltino, the 185, it's, it's so nice to have that small of an implant uh, with still the dog dish. Uh, 
And, uh, and so in patients with a prior buckle or extensive conjunctival scarring, where you really are just trying to squeeze something back there, it works really well. I love it in my kids that have prior hey, actually, muscle let me, let me stop you there. I, I agree with that, actually. So uh, having a the first time. There we go. First time. <laughs> <laughs> a, a 185 plate size. Which I'm not sure if it's going to be dramatically any worse than a 245. Um, and there's very early studies talking about plate sizes and how they mattered. I think now it's it's not panning out to be the same. But um, it, with a 185 plate size, but without like a large kind of uh, area that takes up more room, when you have these thin conge, um, maybe older patients, I agree. It's a fantastic tube when you're looking at pressures that might get you a little bit lower than something with a valve. You know, I moved away from, we, we're going to get on the discussion of whether size matters. And I've really moved away from 350s um, almost entirely uh, because what, what happens is when you see these patients that did have tubes placed in the 80s um, and they're, you know, people are living longer and longer despite, uh, despite the way we're handling this pandemic. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, what's happens with age is aqueous production goes down. And, um, and so you, you're going to start to end up having um, tube associated hypotony. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And, uh, and so, and I think it's more likely uh, the older patients you have that had 350s in the past, you know, you see these 80 year old little ladies that come in that had a two, 350 done, you know, 10, 20 years ago, and their pressures are going to be four and you on nothing and you can't do anything to it. Well, we've come up with ways of doing it, but as another surgery. Uh, so I, I do like the smaller tubes uh, because I think there is um, uh, more control and more protection against chronic hypotony long-term. Uh, but we can go to the next slide. Uh, do you have anything else to add when you would, what, uh, any outside of these scenarios? Yeah, no, I think th those are fantastic. One area that we kind of deviate, I, I love that you use it over scleral buckles and, and we'll talk about that. Um, initially I didn't actually, I was avoiding it around buckles until I talked to you and then yeah, it's great actually. That that rigid plate is really nice. I used to use bar valves because I could trim them to trim size yeah. depending on yeah. the lunch. But yeah, I'm 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 definitely with you with you there. Yeah. All right. So you know, one thing that I've been playing with a lot um, over the past five to seven years, basically, is is how we tie off the tube. And and I really think this could be you know, a one hour lecture in itself, because uh, I've really kind of, I think there's a lot of subtle nuances that people don't talk about with why and how we vary the way the tube ties off. And, and I always kind of, I treat my patients the way I want to be treated. And I do every time I'm a I'm a patient. Every time I interact with the healthcare system, I end up becoming a better doctor. And, um, and I'll talk about that when it comes to this. So, you know, some people initially, initially with kids, um, we were doing these first stage tubes where we just put the plate in and tuck the tube away and then go back to the operating room and tuck it in. And, uh, you know, I've done that in like my Sturge Weber. I operate on a six week old or six, sorry, six day old Sturge Weber kid that I did a, a GAT on. Um, but uh, given the high risk of failure um, of circumfrontal trabeculotomy after Sturge Weber, I put in a first stage tube and then just tucked it off to the side because she was only six days old. I went back in four years later and plugged it back in. Um, but, uh, but that's really uh, not the most common way now. You know, the, the most common thing as done in the, uh, the TBT, PTBT trials and a lot of the other tube shunt trials were tying it off with a 7-0 Vicro. You know, some people like to tie, tie it up with a 5-0. I don't do that. I, I was trained the classic way is the 7-0 Vicro. Um, and then there's a lot of other, as, as uh, one of the questions I think uh, Catherine Friedel asked mm -hmm. about using a, a, a Latina stitch or some type of rip cord in the lumen. Some people do that. Um, and uh, let's go through a couple of these scenarios. So can you go to the next slide, please? Yep. Um, and uh, yeah, so this one is the classic way. I think it's the one that we have the most experience with. What I, you know, it's nice because the tube opens on its own. You don't have to do anything about it, but that's also a bad thing, especially for example, in this pandemic, um, you know, if you were in the depths of the pandemic and, and you really, um, you know, especially in March and April, uh, you know, I would be sweating if, if, if I knew that a patient's, you know, tube was set to open on April, you know, 10th uh, and I wasn't going to be able to see them. And I always get worried, you know, especially my patients that are still young and active. Um, I think about uh, when they need to go back to work. And, um, and I like to know when that tube is going to open. So I've really actually moved away from this because I always was nervous when I said, you know, sir, take a couple weeks off. Don't bend over two weeks. If you feel something, stop your glaucoma drops or, you know, 
trying to time stopping the drops and hoping they don't stop the steroid at the same time. And uh, it just was a setup for, for, for a lot of unpredictability. Um, so I've really moved away from that. Um, some people like to do the, uh, the rip cord and the lumen while tying it off with the Vicro, which is kind of simulating this dog dish that the Maltino implant inherently has that inherent protection from immediate hypotony. Um, but some people still like that. Uh, there's a theory. Uh, do you think that if you have a ripcord in place uh, in the back, if it's say it's a 4.0 nylon or or a, a 5.0 ripcord, if you know the tube opens, the flow's going, do you do you really think there's a lot of benefit by just then cutting down and removing that ripcord? Or uh, what, what are no. your thoughts on that, Arsham? No. So we uh, when we were doing some some papers on some other devices, we actually uh, looked at putting in sutures inside a bar belt and until you get down to like the two or one oh yeah. the four and five oh really doesn't give you any additive resistance you're talking about maybe maybe at best a millimeter of mercury of restricted flow yeah. and before you chime in there's other techniques out there too where people start talking about really tight tunnels coming out of europe so a really tight tunnel fitting a tube within a really tight tunnel to flow restricted through the tunnel that also is extremely difficult to get consistently. Yeah. So um, yeah, I, I, I don't think that uh, that once the tube's open, if you already have flow, the vehicle's gone and you try to remove the pull, rip cord, that it's gonna add much as far as lowering the pressure. Yeah. I do think it does protect from immediate low pressures though to a subtle point, um, but, but, um, but I don't routinely do that. Uh, you can go to the next one, just tying off the tube permanently with either a proline or a nylon. Um, you know, some people like that um, because then it doesn't open until you want it to open. But then the problem is you've got to find some way to open it and you can laser it. Uh, but if they have thick tenons or you can't find it, then you're really hosed and you've got to go back to the operating room and, and, and find it. Or if you if the patient can't cooperate with the laser, it really sweating it out. So I don't like that technique a lot at all. Uh, I used to tie off the tube in the anterior chamber. I learned that from Paul Palmberg um, and then do a slow melt um, of the tube in the AC. Um, I've had a couple problems with that because when you do bend the tube, it can kink and it can go, it can kink posteriorly and sometimes hit the iris or the lens or it can pink uh, bend anteriorly and, um, and hit the cornea. So, um, and then the other problem with that is then you have no ability to fenestrate because you've tied it off in the AC and you don't have the option to fenestrate at all. Um, and so this is, uh, this is a picture I took a long, long time ago. And I, I love this picture, mm -hmm. um, because I took it. No, uh, <laughs> I love this picture because it shows some really interesting things that, um, so this is a patient, I used to always, when I did this, I would tie it off in the AC, but sometimes you weren't sure that you got a complete occlusion. So just to be safe, I would tie it off with the 7-0 Vicryl. And so this patient comes in and it was like two months later and the Vicryl had opened, but because uh, they, he had a occlusion in the AC, um, there was no flow. But if you can see, um, if you, I, I don't know if you guys can see, there's some whitish material mm -hmm. uh, proximal to the suture that you can see. And so, you know, whenever the tube opens, you all see a little bit of inflammation. And it's because there's some, and this is proof that there's a, a reflux of some inflammatory debris in the anterior chamber that would have happened had that proline not been there. So I, I love this picture just because it was really, it kind of in my mind proves what we all see um, and that when the tube opens and the reason why we see reflux is some of that debris can go back into the eye. Um, and so, but this last one, tying off the tube, with a 70 proline, with a uh, basically a, a 40 nylon rip cord, either tucked in the subconscious space and for a temporal, or kind of this coat hanger where you come out and come back in, and then you have this little exposed elbow, um, is really the kind of technique I've moved to now. Um, the exposed elbow. I had a patient that uh, fell in a lake. You know, Texas has a ton of lakes, and he was messing with his boat, and he fell in the lake. Um, and he got an um, and, um, and so I've moved away from this coat hanger technique in very few exceptions. One of the exceptions is when I know that, the, that I'm going to open up that tube in a couple months and the patient is squirmy and, and can't tolerate it. But if they can tolerate it, I basically just at the slit lamp will have, you know, I'll tuck a little inferior uh, in the inferior temporal quadrant, a little 4 nylon, and then I'll just cut down and remove it. What I like about this is that I can fenestrate the heck out of it. You can go to the next slide, I think. Um, I think and I... let me let me interject here because we could pr potentially address this one question from Dr. Sohini. Um, but as far as comparing at least like clear path 
to Maltino right now. And it's something that I think it's not just me, like other people have noticed. Uh, with the clear path, if you're not using a rip cord, it's very difficult to, to suture the lumen closed. The, the, the tube's just different than, than what you might see with the bare vault and the Maltino. Um, so if you're using clear path, I think using the rip cord probably would make it easier to tie it off. That's one advantage of using a rip cord. Actually, you can really cinch the tube down for your, your vicral tie or if you're using proline. Um, the Maltino has been very consistent as far as as closing that off with uh, with the vicral suture. But I will tell you, like like long range results, I couldn't tell you if there's any difference right now. Anecdotally, we have some clear paths that have opened up and they behave very similarly to what we've seen with other tubes. I don't know if you have other experienced vendor or you think they're similar. Yeah, I, I do. You know, it's funny because I, um, you know, I've heard people say that it's tough tying off the tube in a clear path, um, and um, and I, I was. Um, I never had that experience, but I think it is because I've switched entirely to this technique where I do a, a, the, the 4 nylon rip cord and I tie it off with a proline. And so for me, it, it closes every time. Yep. Uh, so I don't know that, but I have heard that from a lot of very, very good surgeons. Um, and that's it, it, they've had a hard time with that. And Dr. Sohini, if you're noticing that too, because you just chimed in that you agreed. Um, one thing you can do is you could switch to a larger suture. So like even going up to like a 6.0 ties it off really nicely without even needing uh, the rip cord in there. The only reason why I don't like doing that is because then I have to open a whole nother suture. We can do even our traction suture we use with a 7.0 Vicro, uh, tie off the tube with the 7.0 Vicro and close cons with that same suture. Yeah. Sometimes what I've done also is I've tied it off twice, you know, uh -huh, and yep. you know, I've, I've just come a little bit more interior and tied it off again. So, um, but, um, but, you know, so uh, more details about this, I fenestrate a lot. Um, and what's crazy is when I do this technique, sometimes I've had my fenestrations work for six months. Yeah. And I think there is, you know, when you go back to some of the uh, early studies that, you know, Dr. Maltino was doing that you were talking about with, you know, this evil aqueous coming into the eye when the, um, and this pro-inflammatory aqueous. What I like about this technique is I really, if you can wait two to three months, if not four months, if not five months, um, to open up that tube, then you really know the eyes calm down. And I think you get a less of an inflammatory reaction, a less of a fibrotic reaction that can cause the capsule to, to form. And what's crazy is I've actually, um, I had one, uh, woman in her thirties or so who had a PK. Um, and I did this technique and I didn't open up her tube literally for like a year and a half. Um, and, um, and then I felt super confident uh, that I could, that I could open. but I, I like this because then, especially my young active patients, I fenestrate it. I say, take a week off work and then go back to work. And then let's plan it around your life. Arrange the time. We'll check your pressure every now and then. And then when the pressure starts creeping up, talk to your manager or talk to your, you know, arrange your work life, your family life, your vacation life, everything to know that, Hey, you're going to come in. I'm going to open up the tube. We're going to put, I'll put a drop of atropine in the eye. We'll stop the glaucoma drops. And then, you know, for the next week, you got to be on restrictions. And that has really given me a lot of comfort. I, I used to do this only with my monocular patients or patients on blood thinners. And now I've really just switched to do this on everybody. And it just lets me sleep better at night. Um, uh, do you have any other, I know you mentioned that the, the, the tunnel tight tunnel thing, what other techniques or if anybody in the audience has other techniques, I'm always willing to to hear and learn new ways. Uh, do, you, do you have any other ways you think of, Arsham? Uh, no, I mean, for, for tying off, not really. I think uh, I do like a staged procedure, especially in, in cases where there might be like elevated either epistural venous pressure, high risk of superfoidals. So some uh, Sturge Weber patients, actually, I'm yeah. not a huge fan of trabeculectomy there, but um, a staged tube is, is nice, a staged opening. And in fact, you can do it exactly what Devender's talking about, where you can put in a rip cord, put in a proline, and you have complete control over where you're going to open it. Um, some people have even waited until the capsule forms, then they're in the OR. Like the Sturge Weber in children, I think is very different than adults, just because you can't do some of this stuff with the slit lamp. So yeah. I have placed the plate down, sutured it, then you actually come back to the OR two or three months later, and then you place the tube in the anterior chamber, you check and see how the flow is going. So the tube is essentially tucked away from the plate under the conge, conge is closed, wait for the capsule to form, come back and then uh, place your tube in the AC. And then in the AC, you can actually check, elevate the pressure in the eye and see how it's doing. And um, I haven't had one where I've had to tie it off again uh, to restrict flow, but it feels like it's a little bit safer there. And, and then, you know, they don't sit at the slit lamp to remove the, the, the proline or, or your ripcord. Yeah, some of these um, 
patients with elevated epistolar venous pressure or these aphagic patients or patients on blunt thinners that can't be taken off. Uh, what we've done is, you know, we've done the, the, the ripcord technique where they come in, we open it, and then I actually will inject a little bit of viscoelastic in the eye to really help minimize that, that, that huge fluctuation in pressure. Um, yeah. And, you know, while we're talking about that, Devinder, like, what's your, um, what is your ideal scenario? Because I think people vary on how they treat with medication. So, uh, you know, in my mind, and I don't want to bias you, I really don't like going from a pressure of 40 to 10. And so sometimes I'll maybe over medicate, like closer to the time when the tube's going to open. Because I'd rather take that smaller delta in pressure reduction so that I don't get that massive, all of a sudden, low pressure, chordals or an expulsive hemorrhage. Do you, do you have any thoughts on that? I think you're dead on. I mean, you, that, that's the best setup for, for bad things to happen is when you go from 40 to 10. Uh, so, so no, I don't like a sudden decompression of the eye at all. Um, and so, uh, so I do. Um, and again, but that's the thing that used to keep me up at night is I would have patients on max meds and then the four week point comes along and I'm like, well, shoot, do I stop it? Have them stop it at four weeks? Do I have them stop it at, you know, five weeks or do I just wait for them to call? And, um, and so, uh, so that has, I've taken that whole thing off the picture, uh, off the table, because now I, I've switched entirely to this technique. Uh, which then allows me to uh, slowly escalate drops uh, and, and treatment. And then when their pressure gets to the 25 range, and if we're in time, I say, okay, sir, it's time to do it. Let's open it up. And so I have, um, um, I have a little bit more, uh, uh, more control. Um, let me, let me, let me uh, bring up one other question. Um, we, it says Nova, I have actually seen the seven of Vico cut through the tube when tying it off. Is this something that you have also seen? I've seen that with every tube. Clear path, it's happened. I've had it with a barbell. Um, I've had it with a Maltino. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I think part of it is like when you're tying it off, if you don't have a ripcord there, that's when it's going to happen. And if you take the suture and you continue to pull tight, even once you see it crimp down, um, that's your sign that you keep pulling tight. There is a chance you're going to sever that tube. Yeah, I've, I've seen it on every every tube. Every I've seen tube. it with Maltinos. I've seen it with barbells. I've um, um, I haven't seen it yet with, with clear path, but, uh, but I, it's just a matter of, I think it's just a matter of time. I think you take any suture, you tie it tight enough. You can, you can amputate anything. Um, so, yeah. um, so yeah, so these are the, you know, this is what we're talking about when we want, when we want to avoid that sudden decompression, uh, these are all the patients that we really want to have controlled opening. And, um, well, why and don't we I talk a little bit about maybe how you would manage, say you had a patient that, um, that like specifically we can do with Maltinos, but. Um, say at a patient where the tube opens up on its own and all of a sudden you have a moderate chamber, slightly shallow, like in the periphery, you might have some iris touch, but centrally you might have like three or four corneal thicknesses and, um, and you have early coronal effusions, but not a hemorrhage. What do you think uh, would be a good way to manage that? Uh, I'm a, I'm a huge, huge believer in atropine. Mm -hmm. I love atropine, uh, either once a day or twice a day. And, um, and so, you know, when the tube is opening, uh, when I open the tube in the clinic and I have control opening, I always put a drop of atropine in the eye. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you, you got to bomb the eye with steroids, um, and then limit activity, you know, have them keep their head above the heart, avoid any type of Valsalva. Um, and, uh, we got another question. Um, Alejandro Valencia, Valencia was asking about uh, squints after implants. And I think, you know, um, that's without question, my, uh, the biggest hesitation I have of doing tube shunts is the risk of double vision. Because yeah. you give a patient, no matter what age they are, you give them double vision and they're miserable. Um, so uh, I, I do think, and I don't think we have any hard data on this yet. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think the implants that don't involve muscle manipulation, that are single quadrant implants like the Maltino, um, uh, I think are at lower risk of causing double vision. Yeah, I was I was kind of in that boat. And, and then I started looking at the Ahmed Bearvelt data. And certainly, like, if you're under muscles, you're, you'll say, hey, you know, there's a higher risk that you're going to have some type of a deviation. Um, the Ahmed Bearvelt studies, both AVB and ABC, were similar rates between the 350 and, and the Ahmed as far as, yeah. you know, strabismus, at least it was clinically significant. Um, I think that's because you get that big, big capsule in yeah. these hot eyes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's different when you have a fenestration and, and, and you have it tied off and you don't have these neovascular hot eyes, you know? 
Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. I mean, and, and it's been like almost any type of tube shunt, whether it's got wings under a muscle or not, like there will be some deviation there. The, yeah. the main thing to actually consider is, and um, if they're going to go in and do strap surgery, most uh, strap surgeons are going to operate on the other eye. It's very difficult once you start mucking within that capsule, because once it's penetrated or punctured, there's a good chance for hypotony. And any consideration with a second implant in the same eye, um, yeah. it really depends on the deviations doing though. So if you're super temporal on the first go and you have a, what it usually is, is a restrictive, both superior rectus and lateral rectus. So that's the palsy that they'll typically notice. Um, and so if you're placing another implant in the inferior quadrant, inferonasal quadrant, which is most people's second choice, um, now you're talking about inferior oblique, medial rectus, inferior uh, rectus. There's a chance that if they've already shown a fibrotic process enough to cause a deviation, that you could wind up with something very unpredictable once you place another device there. And I'll tell you, um, I had a patient that was uh, the most dramatic strabismus I've ever seen. Um, the first surgery was a bar belt 350 done by a very good glaucoma surgeon who then referred the patient in because that tube shunt had to be removed because the deviation was so great. Just the bleb ended up creating a really large hypo deviation on that eye. So I thought, well, you know, it was a non-valved tube shunt. I don't like doing Ahmed's inferiorly, but let's, let's try it. Maybe there's a different fibrotic process. Same thing happened with it. The eye just went the other way. And I would just venture that whatever process there is in that patient's eye that led to that, I'd be very cautious that it's probably going to happen again. And, and it doesn't, again, like what Devinder said, it does not have to be under the muscle. The fibrotic reaction around the capsule is what can kind of connect itself to the muscles and cause these restrictive strabismus. And other things that, you know, if the patient's had prior retina surgery, prior yeah. buckle, prior, that, that's just a setup, no matter what the plate is. And you got um, uh, like retinal slip, like patients have like horrible visual field loss and they have really bad visual fields in both eyes. You could have retinal slip. This just kind of tips it over where now you have some paralysis or restrictive thing in the muscle. Um, yeah, they're, they're, I think uh, strabismus in, in these cases is very, very difficult. It can be. Yeah. Um, but I think also well, the way I read uh, Alejandro's question was actually whether if, if it fails, would we do a second tube? Um, I didn't know. I, maybe Alejandro, you're talking about um, a second implant after double, double vision or, or what, but, but I think we addressed, we addressed both, but I, it's funny. I, you give a patient double vision with a glaucoma drainage implant and um, I'd be shocked if you can convince them <laughs> to get another, another tube in their eye, they were literally uh, will, will, you know, do anything in their power to avoid another tube. Uh, it's just miserable. Um, and and let's staying on this slide then, um, when would you fill the AC after a tube shunt? Like what, what's your criteria? Cause I don't think we do it very often. I don't think we have to do it very often. Once you get kind of accustomed to what you're, what you're working with. Do you mean when I'm, when I'm opening up the tube? No, no. Or, what were the scenarios where you feel like, Oh, in clinic, I had to do an AC fill with like this. Oh, okay. Um, I don't mind a little eye K touch and a little bit of irritable corneal touch, a little shallow choroidals. I don't, I don't mind that at all. Uh, I don't like lens cornea touch, uh, or if the tube is smashed up against the cornea, um, and and in those kind of situations, then I will, uh, then I will inject some viscoelastic. But a little peripheral shallowing and uh, irritable corneal touch doesn't bother me at all. And, and I'm with you. I think tube. acropine is magical in some oh, of those, amazing. those cases. Stopping yeah. the meds, consider a beta blocker on the other eye, stopping that for at least a week or two, there can potentially be crossover. Um, those are the, the, the types of things to consider and atropinize before jumping necessarily to, to filling it with viscoelastic. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we're getting some really good questions. Uh, Greg, I'm going to get to your fenestration, uh, the fenestration technique um, and when we show some videos. Um, and then uh, Gagan was asking um, about, will we change uh, the type of alva oh. to do a second implant? I, dude, I've stopped. I, I, I used to do a second implant like mm -hmm. once a week, twice yeah. a week. Yeah. Um, and I tell you what, we're gonna get to this data later on, on CPC diodes after tubes. But now I will do a second tube maybe once or twice a year. Yeah. So what do you do? What do you, what do you, what do you? What I am with there? you. I felt like at the beginning I was doing much more infranasal second tubes. We had some of our VA patients that were onto their third tube. Um, I, 
I've been involved in doing a fourth tube once. Um, yeah. But I can tell you that I have gone away from that completely because of the diode thing. Now, and we'll talk about that. The only times when I start talking about really placing a second tube is if there's CME, if there's a reason or they're uveitic and I don't want to do a diode that could kick things off, then I've been doing second tubes. Do I change the type of valveless tube? You know, I actually don't. But what I'll factor in is this. If I look and I place my, sur my first tube, say it was... Um, like we did a bare valve, okay? And the bleb is just really, really tense and it's really mounded and the pressure's up again. Yes, I'm gonna try a different type of tube. But if I look and the bleb looks generally good, it might've been functional for like a year or two and now I'm looking at a second tube, um, then I'm okay with the same type of tube. And for nasally, I find Maltino to be very nice for placement there. Uh, but I actually find it a little bit easier than like some of the soft tubes. Uh, and, and it's got a very nice low profile, which is, which is what you want. Um, so those are kind of my thoughts on, on changing for, for the, the tube style when I do a second one. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I these vascular paths, the bad diabetics, these, you know, these leaky, leaky eyes where you see a lot of flare, you don't want to diode those eyes. Um, and so I, those are the times that I'll do a second tube. I, I completely agree. Um, and then um, as far as a uh, hypertensive phase and, and no. flushing, uh, what do you do to prevent your hypertensive phase? Because I, I know it's such a key, such a key point. I, I totally agree. I, I really think, I mean, a lot of what we're doing, like obviously the aqueous matters. We don't want as much aqueous running into that subbleb space. Hypertensive phase will happen with a valve tube or a valveless tube. And uh, something that's interesting, and I think uh, until you say it, people don't really think about it, Scarring doesn't just happen because of fluid. You remember these capsules form without any flow when we have the tubes tied off. So one is material, one is just the surgical trauma, but the other thing is actually tension. So tension is a very strong mediator of eliciting a fibrotic reaction because to the eye, maybe teleologically or revolution, anytime you have this kind of enlarged space, the body sees that as a wound, it's gonna react down. But also sometimes leaving steroids on for a really long time at high doses, not necessarily once we start to taper lower dose, really high dose steroid can potentially even do the opposite where you inhibit degradation or remodeling of that capsule. Not only is there a steroid response, but you could inhibit that. I think this is a very tricky thing to answer. The bottom line for me is this, when I know the tube is getting close to opening, I will treat with medications just to try to get it down so I don't have that large delta. If the pressure is like 14 when the tube initially opens, I'll keep them on the medication. I'm okay with keeping the meds until I get the steroids off board, reducing that tension, reducing the aqueous that's hitting that bleb. And then you can consider maybe tapering off some of your drops. I mean, it's very similar to kind of what data that we see out of the, the, the aqueous suppression studies with, with the Ahmed valve. Um, we know that if we start treating it, once you start getting to a pressure of around 12 after week one, you start adding drops to keep the pressure down. Um, to the point where some patients we've dropped into hypotony even doing that. It does decrease the, the hypertensive phase, which also gives you a little bit better results in the long run. Flushing, you know, interesting thing about flushing. Um, there is a uh, more of like an in vitro and vivo study looking at how fluid moves through a bleb. And the instant that you put fluid through a bleb, the next time you push fluid through a bleb, your bleb porosity or the ease at which fluid leaves the bleb decreases. And you kind of have to ask yourself why. I think there's a lot of theory behind it. First of all, bleb porosity matters based on plate size, the shape of the plate, how much aqueous is going through it. Um, but the other thing is, you know, the tension. I don't think flushing really works in the long run. I've flushed tubes before that we might be taking in to do some other type of surgery and maybe the pressure wasn't ideal. I've had some where you feel this initial pop. And I don't know if you've done it, Devendra, you have internal go in with like a 27 gauge hypodermic or, or a 27 gauge blunt cannula, push fluid through it. I've used tripan to kind of see where it goes. But generally, in general, those patients end up at about the same pressure that they wound up at. The only thing might be if there was like fibrin or something blocking it and you had no bleb that you saw, I think flushing it is reasonable. What do you think? No, I think you, I mean, I, it's, it's such a great way of describing that. I think, you know, I, the way I think about the capsule, um, 
and this is how I describe the hypertensive phase to my patients. The only thing about the capsule around the plate is I think of it like one of those Chinese finger tricks. Uh -huh. the, the, the harder you pull, the more the resistance is. <laughs> and what I want to do is I want to relax that, that Chinese finger trip. I want to relax the capsule. So how do you relax it? So you, you start aqueous suppressants. Uh, and I think you're dead on. You're going to get a, a steroid response when you're bombing the eye with steroids four times a day. And so once the a AC is quiet, uh, or mostly quiet. I may cut the steroid down to twice a day and start them on aqueous suppressant, um, and um, and then let the let the capsule relax. Uh, still control the inflammation with a mild steroid, um, and then and then follow them over time. And I will sometimes, you know, when I when I open up the tube in the clinic, I'll have them stop all the drops. I'll bomb the eye with steroids four times a day, and I'll tell them in one week start timolol come back and see me in you know two to three weeks. Um, and so I'll anticipate that hypertensive phase, even when you haven't opened up the tube uh, for, uh, um, for, you know, for six months or so. Yeah. Um, do you, where do you tie off your tube? Do you tie it off on the table or uh, on the patient, on the eye, or do you tie it off the back table? Yeah, I do it on the back table when everything else is going on now. So um, I tie it off. Right now I can still see it. Um, and I, the technique's kind of like nice. I, when, you know, you turn with your scrub, that little card that they have on, on your gown, it's got a white background. So they'll hold that for me. I'll put my Maltino on the table. I have my Vicryl that's already pre-cut for my traction suture. So I'll take a very small amount and I'll actually thread that Vicryl up through one of the suture holes of the Maltino. And that kind of holds it in place. Then I'll do a three throw tie. My BSS cannula is already in the Maltino. So once I tie it off, throw that first suture, I like to just kind of pull like consistent pressure, not all of a sudden tight, the sutures will break, but just consistent pressure, make sure it's a square knot. My tube is already cannulated or that, that uh, BSS cannula is cannulated in the tube. I'll push. If I get a little flow, I'll tie it a little tighter. But actually that second throw can sometimes cinch things down a little bit further. And with the Maltino, I found it to be extremely consistent to close with that technique. And then the, again, I'll test it again. If I get no flow, I'll do my fenestration, push again, and it's ready to go. I'll put it right back in the small little compartment that it comes in. Um, and by that time, usually the prep's done and, and we can start. Yeah, I, 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 um, I'm a little bit more spoiled in my OR, or, but I don't have any fellows or residents. So, uh, <laughs> you know, my assistant has everything set up. She already has the sutures. The tube's tied ready. off. Um, the suture's already trimmed. Oh, no, no the tube's not tied off. Although they, <laughs> somebody, she does tie it off. She's already something. done the surgery for you. Exactly. <laughs> uh, no, she does tie it off for somebody, but I like to tie it off for myself. Uh, maybe I'm just a control freak, but uh, <laughs> but she has it all ready for me. And uh, what I, one thing you can do also, which is nice, is to get an air bubble in the tube mm -hmm. when you're flushing it, because then you can see the air bubble compress. Um, and uh, and so I do that in the back table while they're prepping and draping, uh, draping the patient and everything like that. But it's just an, it, it'll save you. Uh, and uh, there we go. Yes, yeah, so I so Arshams does think size matters, and and every time we're in the operating room together, he um, uh, I'll explain this story why there's why he need to make up later. But every time in the, we're in the operating room together, he likes to point out um, the difference of his gloves and my gloves. Um, but um, but these these uh, these five and a half size hands still uh, still do their job. What so, what uh, is your actual glove size? Five and a half. No, you're not. <laughs> no, you're not. no, I'm nine and a half. Um, <laughs> um, but no, I don't think it matters, dude. It's like, yeah. you know, it's just these these hands are Donald Trump hands. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> these hands. Um, so, um, but I, I don't think it matters, right? So I used to do a lot of 350s and I've moved over to to the smaller plate size. And I, you know, it's, it's funny now that... Um, Post COVID, I've stopped blocking almost all my patients. Mm -hmm. And so I do a sub tenons block on the table, but they still will feel you tugging on the muscles. Yeah. Yeah. And I love not having to tug on the muscles. And it, I think it improves patient comfort, patient experience, um, efficiency in the OR. Uh, and I also think, as we've discussed, I think it decreases the risk of, of, of uh, double vision. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm with you. Let's let's talk a little bit about about this, actually, as far as the, the diodes go, because we have some questions and we still have some videos to show and we're, we're getting maybe another 20 minutes yeah. or so on time. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, you know, I, I would basically um, I usually go to CPC diode first. Um, I, 
Um, I feel that's a little bit more predictable in my hands than, than Micropulse right now, as far as the mm -hmm. settings and everything are concerned. Um, and, uh, uh, but, you know, depending on the size and the age of the patient. So if it's a young patient with a large plate, then I will do something like 1,000 milliwatts or 1,100 milliwatts or 1,200 milliwatts. If they're on like, say the pressure is 30 on max meds and orals, then I'm going, you know, big, you know, full guns, 1,200 milliwatts, 4,000 milliseconds, 30 spots. Um, and, uh, but if they're a little old lady with a, a you know, a 250 and, um, or, a, you know, a, a 245 Maltino, and um, and she's on three meds, and I just want to get around to one. Uh, then I will do something like 700 milliwatts, you know, 25 spots, 4,000 milliseconds. I, I tell them, my patients, I want you on one at least one drop, because I want the ability to to uh, to turn the knob one way or another. I don't want to get you to 11 on no drops. I get nervous at that point because then I don't have the ability non-surgically to raise your pressure. What do you, what do you do? Yeah, I, I have really liked the slow burn technique, like uh, usually start around 1250, 4000 milliseconds, and it might be like 18, 16, 18 spots. Um, and if I hear a pop, I, I back down. I really don't want to hear a pop of the celery processes. But I think diode and, and there's studies ongoing. I know COVID kind of slowed it down, but diode versus second tube in a patient with a primary tube already. Yeah. And yeah. I, I think um, what we'll probably find in my mind, I guess, that you'll have more repeat diodes, but I think the you're not taking the OR trips back um, and you'll probably see pretty similar pressure reductions and, and safety. Yeah. And so, I mean, the data is out there, you know, the yeah. data is out there. Um, and uh, and I still do. Yeah. Uh, Gagan is asking about uh, G probe or, or the micropulse. So we're talking about traditional CPC diode or the G probe. Um, yeah. That's my first go to. If I go back for a second treatment, then I'll consider doing the micropulse. Uh, but I think there's very good retrospective data. And Arshan points yeah. out to the prospective trial uh, that's coming out of um, out of Houston. Um, but the retrospective data, in my mind, is is quite convincing that uh, that a, a, a so low energy diode is 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 just so key. Um, I, yeah, so I, let's, I totally, I totally agree. Um, hey, Devinder, let's, let's, um, cause Dr. Sohaney has uh, some other questions cause this might be a good time to start getting into it and then into some of your videos. So do you prefer long scleral tunnels or somewhat shorter ones with a patch graph? What's your preference? Um, I like a, um, I like to tunnel it. Um, I don't like to do four or five millimeter tunnels. I like to do, you know, two to three millimeter tunnels. Um, I think the longer I, when I go I get a very long tunnel, then I just, I don't have the same, I, maybe it's just a skill thing that I don't have, but I, no, I, I have I, a hard I, time. I, I usually can't predict my placement in the AC and I tend to get a little too close to the cornea. Well, uh, you have a lot of, and you have a lot of tissue over the top. So it's yeah. almost like a seesaw fulcrum. Like you tend to, to shift that tube with that much sclera you shift it pointed upwards toward toward yeah. the corner I, I agree with you a really long tunnel that's the risk yeah uh but let's do let's do this let's talk through this uh this and then this. and then uh so patch graft uh do you alter your fenestrations whether you do a long tunnel or a patch graft i personally don't no, I um don't. do you titrate your fenestrations uh, the number that you do based on the starting pressure yeah, I do. You know, if uh -huh. the pressures are well controlled, but there's a, usually if I'm taking the OR, the pressures are uncontrolled, right? Right. So, yeah. Um, so, uh, so, but I tend to fenestrate a lot. Uh, uh -huh. You know, I don't do one fenestration. I will do three to four to sometimes five fenestrations. Um, but you can get really burned badly on that, and I have been burned um, by that um, when uh, if the patient rubs their eye or something like that, and you don't get a proper nice closure so if you are fenestrating a lot um and i'll say anything more than three fenest three or more fenestrations you've got to be a stickler on closing that gonge really well and, and defender yeah. like you're when we're in the or you know you could fenestrate 10 times i'm exaggerating but if you check at the time you remove your viscoelastic i prefer to remove the viscoelastic before i close the conge if i use viscoelastic okay yes. um some people are doing it many if you're not training you do it without viscoelastic just check to make sure that you're holding some stability of the chamber, because if you're not, then you can go in and tie off again, just in front of your fenestrations, and you just maybe repeat just one fenestration instead of multiple. Wait, when do you put viscoelastic in the eye? So, do you do it in um, all your tubes? Well, yeah, I mean, we're, we're working with residents and fellows, okay. first timers, second year residents. So um, the, the important thing is if you're doing your tube entry, make sure it's on a closed system so you don't have like air that just gushes out. Uh, but yeah, so we, we'll use a 
just a cohesive viscoelastic that will remove after they insert the tube. I don't want them hitting lenses, man. Interesting. I, I, I usually wash everything out before I will, yeah. uh, you know, if I'm doing a combined case, mm -hmm. I'll wash it out. Um, and the one time I didn't, uh, I think some of the visco clogged the finish. And, yeah. uh, and I got really, uh, I got burned by that too. Uh, I get burned by everything. Um, <laughs> so, uh, just, just looking at glaucoma burns us. Yeah, exactly. Well, uh, let me, let me play your video. Are you good kind of narrating over this? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is, yeah, this is the 250. Uh, this is the ripcord technique that I was describing uh, with the, um, and so this is an uh, 80 micro um, uh, traction suture. It's a patient with a prior uh, corneal transplant. Um, and, uh, you know, um, I, I size at the, at the limbus. Uh, I don't like to use a lot of cautery. Uh, I, you know, I, I think there's a reason for blood vessels and, um, and I don't want to create any more ischemia. Um, so I, those are the Steven scissors. I like to create that nice pocket, uh, but I don't like to do a lot of cautery. And um, so it keeps it a little bit more uh, bloody. And I'm going to pause it and you can see there's a 4 nylon ripcord. Um, I think I have a still frame, Marshall, you can unpause it. Uh, and and, a, and that, that's a, it's a 7-0, by, uh, seven or proline that I keep long and I'll trim it a little bit, but you like it to lay flat, just like when you're doing a sutured IOL. Uh, and then you can see those nice, um, uh, those nice anterior eyelets, uh, that, that help. And, um, and then I'll tie them off. That's a 909, uh, 90, uh, proline suture. And you can see down there, you see this, the, the, the 40 nylon suture is, uh, uh, is hanging out there. And I'll show you what I do with that later. Uh, we can advance it just a little bit. You know, this is just me tying it off and fixing the plate uh, with the 90 nylon. And um, and then what I'm doing here is I like to secure, and this is controversial, um, I like to secure the plate uh, or the tube to the wall of the eye. I think movement of the tube can increase your risk of erosion. So I actually tie it off with a, a, a 90, either a 90 um, a 10 or nylon if I have it open. If not, I'll do a 90 proline. But you got to bury it, and um, and I I keep my this I keep the wings long so they lay flat. And then here's the fenestration technique. This is a TG130, which is also on the 90 nylon not nylon proline uh, needle. And you can see I fenestrate a decent amount, um, and uh, and then I'll put that um, that patch craft over it. I'm not a big fan of the way I've laid the patch craft down here. I mean, I'm going to trim it anteriorly because you can sometimes if you don't, you can get a Dellen. Uh, so you want to make sure it's, um, uh, it's, it's, it's nice. And then um, sometimes if those wings, those are the 90, those are 70 proline sutures uh, that I've left long, I'll tuck it under the plate. So it's not causing any issue. And then this is that rip cord technique that I'm doing. So it's a 40 nylon. So I grab that suture, and I just kind of tuck it underneath the conge in the inferior temporal quadrant as far down as I can go. And I'll tell my patient, say, hey, this is my suture. This is not an eyelash. Don't go fishing around and don't let anybody but me or one of my partners or a glaucoma specialist uh, pull that out. Um, and, um, and so you want to pull it tight. Uh, you don't want to pull it out, obviously. Um, and here I'm going to trim it close to the conge. What I do now is actually keep it long, and then I'll trim it once I'm done closing, because sometimes when you close the conge, you can dislodge it a little bit. And then this is just the, uh, you know, the way I close the conge with 80 Vicro sutures, uh, a mattress on each side, and I run it, and I tend to lock. And, um, and then you can, I think that's pretty much it. You don't need to see a conge closure. Um, but, uh, but that's kind of my, my bread and butter technique for, uh, for a standard, uh, tube with my, uh, do you want to, uh, Greg's question he was asking about describe the fenestration technique. Um, do you have that on this video or is it on the, yeah, next yeah. That I fenestrated, um, if you kind of go back, you can see, I mean, I just, um, yeah, right, right there. That's yep, it. Yep. That's a, so it's a, it's the, it's the TG-130 needle, and that's typically on a 70 Vicro, but it can also, it's also the same needle on a 90 proline. Uh, and then I'll just, you know, I'll just go and I'll go along and I like to go through. Um, I've always in my, in my back of my mind, I've always had the, like the nightmare of, of amputating it or slicing through the tube. Uh, I do like to make it full thickness but through both sides of the tube. Uh, but if you, uh, that's, that kind of showed my technique. What's your technique for that? Uh, the fenestration, I use the same 70 uh, suture needle and I'll fenestrate just once, just right in front of, very similar to what you do. I do want to make sure that I go through and through though. Yeah. So it's not just going to be on one side. Okay. Um, do you, do you ever leave like a wick in there? Just a wick suture? No, no, I don't. I, I don't I, that's there. opening that you need, you need to open another suture, I guess. And uh, I just, I, I haven't found that to be predictable. Right. Um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm with you.
Uh, um, do you want to you want to show this one? Yeah, no, go, that's, go to the next page. Just the, the next one is going to be the 185. Uh, go to the next page. There we go. So this is a patient with a prior buckle. And um, and this is one where I've tied off. Actually, you can see this conge was closed, closed by a retina specialist. You can see the folds of the conge. Uh, and um, and and I'm pointing that out. Uh, but basically, it's kind of a tight, con you know, a little bit tight, some conge scarring. And um, and the key thing you can see, there's a some, that's probably the port, the sclerotomy port that they made. Um, and then you want to go make a nice pocket. And, and here I'm going to pause it a little bit. You're going to see the buckle right you see that buckle right there so that's the steven suture scissors going over the buckle um creating a pocket and um i'll fenestrate just a little bit here i just tied it off with a 70 vicro but this is the 185 um nice you know and you can like arsham was saying it's firm enough that you can just slide it back there and then whenever there's a buckle i'm suturing i, I just like to suture it to the plate um uh, suture the uh suture the plate to the buckle so i'm going through the buckle right now and then i've just now you're gonna see me going it going through the eyelets and uh and i think there's nothing more secure than uh than sewing one of these tubes uh one of the plates to to uh, to to the buckle if you can do it um you know sometimes the buckles are so posterior that it's hard to get to it but in this case i was uh you know you can see that's the buckle go through there that's the uh that's the eyelet and um um and I'm able to secure it there. And that gives me confidence that it's not going to dislodge or anything like that, especially with all the- Have you seen, like, do the blebs ever look like maybe they get a little bit more, like they'll spread out across the buckle? Have you seen that? Or do you think they're still- Like a shock it technique? I haven't, yeah. I have not seen that. Uh, yeah. uh, have you seen that? No, no, not not with buckles, actually. I, uh, I've i done them where, I've had one case where I ended up doing that. We're just placing the tube right into the buckle just because it was so scarred that, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Um, it, and honestly, quite frankly, the pressure did not do all that well. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, I, I really like this technique. Now on, on the tube insertion, this is about the length that I use and I will cover with a patch graft afterwards. Yeah. Um, and so I really kind of like that length of the tunnel there. And, and again, I'm looking, I'm okay if it's just a millimeter in the AC, I don't worry so much about seeing like a large tube there and you close typically or you're using cornea then it looks like. I'm using cornea patch graft for, um, for, uh, yeah, for my patch graft, I'm using partial thickness cornea. Yep. Yep. Yeah. I like it. And, well, uh, since we're kind of starting to wind up a little bit, um, I'll go over. Do you want to do yeah, show, your, show your video? Was this the same one? No, yes, yeah, the same one. Go yeah, to the, the next same one. Okay. Um, we, we were kind of talking about securing plates. I do a slightly different technique. Some of the things that I've had to change are just because I deal with trainees and I want to keep things moving along as we're going. Um, what you'll notice here is uh, instead of doing individual suture passes, we're going to do something that requires just a single suture pass. We'll take a five or a six O proline and pass it through one of the eyelets. And what you're trying to do actually is think about when you can make your next forehand pass. You'll see what I mean here, but I'll then pass the suture back through the other side of the plate. So through this eyelet. And now both eyelets have the suture through them. My next maneuver is to actually make a long pass just on the sclera. This has to go parallel to the plane of a tangent along this limbus. So wherever I pass this suture, this is how my plate's gonna sit. It's a lot easier in my mind to kind of determine where the plate's gonna sit. I like this because I'll show you, you only need to make sure that the proline is gonna be behind the tube. So in this case, like the tube's kind of getting sutured around this, I'll just pull it out. But now you have a single pass, you're not working trying to get this like hole in one throw through two different eyelets. And it really secures the plate down nicely. When you tie it and you cut it, it's already buried or you can slightly nudge it over to the side and it'll get it underneath the eyelet. But it's nice for a couple of reasons. There's not multiple passes. We're not digging in a hole in two different spots. Um, it's already pre-placed. I can tell how my plate's gonna sit just by the direction of, of placing that initial suture. And then the knot's already below the plate uh, once we're done. Yeah, that's All the right, wisdom my man. of a, That's the wisdom of a program director. <laughs> that's what ends up happening. Certain things that you change, uh, that's right. Yeah, that's such a key technique. Um, <laughs> Well, Devendra, I don't know if we have a whole lot of uh, questions left. I think we kind of answered them as, as we went. Um, and we, we do have one on how many fenestrations. I think we talked about it. I typically do one at most two fenestrations. Devendra will do sometimes three. Have you done fours and fives? 
Yeah, I do. I mean, again, um, I, you know, I always do things different. I got to change everything. So uh, yeah, I tend to do more. I think three is the fewest number I'll do. But again, it depends on the patient and uh, and everything. And uh, and what's interesting is, the, you know, the fenestrations with a Maltino, I think, last a little bit longer than uh, than the fenestrations with other other implants. And I think it's just the the way the tube is. And it's also interesting. And Arsham, we didn't talk about this, but uh, I feel like when I tie off the Maltino with a with a a seven o vicro. I uh-huh. I think it more consistently opens up around the four week point as opposed uh-huh. to the six week point. It tends to open up a little bit sooner. Um, I I haven't noticed. I know in kids like they end up opening a little bit earlier. They're just they just chew through. They're so pro inflammatory. They they chew through the vicrols. Um, but I agree with you. There is something different about the each. And I don't know. I'd have to go look and see where they're sourced. I thought it was dependent based on how the actual two part of the device is sterilized, whether it's a uh, gas or irradiated or, but, um, but there's something about the fenestrations are different. So if you're changing between two flat platforms, just be cautious about that and just make sure that your eyes holding a good, nice stable chamber at the end of the case. Um, yeah. And then you could start kind of uh, playing with, with additional fenestrations. But, but I have found the tubing of the Maltina to be probably the most consistent when, when we tie it off even. Yeah. So Catherine uh, Friedel is asking one more question about uh, when we're waiting for the to pull the ripcord for a couple of months, how often do I see the patient? Uh, typically, the fenestrations don't shut down immediately. And because I do, you know, three or four or five, sometimes six, uh, I've seen that they just, the pressure will slowly rise. So I'll see them, you know, one day, one week, you know, three to four weeks later, maybe a month or two later, depending on the pressure. And like I said, sometimes if I still have them on steroids four times a day, I will proactively have them go from COSOP once a day to twice a day. Um, and, uh, but I, I, I know, and, and they know to call if there's a problem, but, but I, will, I will slowly increase the, the pressure um, and, um, and I haven't had a problem with hypotony um, and, uh, and it gives me the confidence that the tube's not gonna open until we open it. Yep. Well, listen, buddy, it was great doing this with you. Yeah, dude, this is a lot of fun. Thank you for all your insights. This was this was no, great. you too, man. I'll always learn. And despite the fact that we talk all the time, it's like anytime we do one of these things, I still learn from you, man. Yeah. Well, same here, man. Thank you. Uh, and then these are our contact information. You guys have any questions? Don't hesitate to to, to reach out. Absolutely. Well, thanks so much. I'll uh, I'll close this off. And again, everyone have a great great night. Thanks again. All right. Thank you.